I was 18 and I was hunting for the first time on my own. It was quiet and misty. The air is crisp. The tiny yellow birch leaves are rustling. Suddenly out of the brush steps that bull moose. That's when I took a few deep breaths and just took the shot. I remember just thinking our creator for the gift of the meat and just feeling like this is something that has given its life so that I can live, so that my family can live. For as long as they've lived on the shores of Lake Superior, the Ojibwe or Anishinaabe people have revered and depended on the moose. Game pieces were carved from antlers. Rattles were made from the hooves. Warm stockings were made of the hocks of the moose. Moose hair embroidery it made beautiful clothing. The relationship to the moose is almost mythic. But a few years ago, something strange started happening. The moose began to disappear from the landscape. Minnesota's moose population fell for the 14th straight year. An alarming decline, growing mystery that has scientists baffled and on the hunt for answers. The moose of Minnesota are dying, and no one knows why. The Ojibwe people lived along these banks forever. It's just a really unique place that we call home. The most northeastern point of Minnesota, bordered by Canada and also by Lake Superior. This area has a, a relatively harsh climate. About mid-October to about uh, early May, we typically have snow on the ground. It's a difficult place to live, and so subsisting off of the species that are present here really requires some effort. My family has always harvested deer, moose. It means something to us. It's not a sportsman type of a hunt. It's not a, let's find out who has the biggest set of antlers, you know, or it's just a very special thing. This last year, I went around, I just delivered these baskets of uh, moose meat to like my brother and my, my uh, niece, my, my sister. When you're able to provide for your family yourself, I mean, that's what we're really put here, I think, to do, you know, to take care of each other. It's part of the reason why we care so much about our moose population is because we want to continue to subsistence hunt for, for future generations. But scientists were worried that hunting might be part of the problem. It was our belief that human hunting was a primary cause really affecting mortality in moose. That hypothesis made sense. White settlers and their descendants had hunted the state's native elk and caribou out of existence. So when we saw this decline, it was a, a very immediate decision that we need to understand what's going on and if that decline can be reversed. To figure out what was happening, Seth and his team started going out in helicopters. When they spotted a moose, they'd give it a tranquilizer. Then hike to the moose and place a GPS collar around its neck. After a quick shot to reverse the tranquilizer, the moose would be on its way. And when the moose stops moving for a period greater than six hours, essentially it sends a mortality signal to the satellite, and then the satellite sends a text to my phone. And when we get there, you know, typically we'll find a dead moose. We cut open the moose and take samples from every single organ system in the moose, and we send those off to a diagnostic lab. And the majority of the time, they can tell us what was wrong with that moose. To understand these results, there is something else you need to know about this part of the world. Our winters have changed. Snow drifts as tall as the doorway. You know, I think the last time that happened in my lifetime was 1992. Our average snow depth in, the, in early spring has declined by about 70%, and our temperatures have increased by about five degrees Fahrenheit on average as well. The biggest moose killer that Seth and his team discovered was the brain worm. It's a parasite that lives in the brains of white-tailed deer, but doesn't harm them. Typically, deer and moose don't share the same habitat. With their lighter coats and shorter legs, deer tend to thrive in places with warmer winters. But in the last 30 years, Rising winter temperatures have lured white-tailed deer from the southern part of Minnesota 
into the state's northern reaches, right into the moose's habitat. And the deer bring brainworm with them. Its eggs hatch in the deer's feces, then slugs eat the newly hatched larvae and climb up onto plants. Moose eat those plants, and the slugs, and the worms, which end up in their brains. It tends to tunnel around looking for the right habitat for it, which is a deer's brain, and it's those tunnels that cause the neurological damage. They keep their head tilted and they walk in circles and eventually they just starve to death. When warmer winters bring white-tailed deer further north, that causes another problem for the moose, wolves. The wolf population in northern Minnesota has increased dramatically. Like most predators, wolves follow their main food source. When the moose are giving birth, moose calves are actually the easiest thing on the landscape to eat. We're losing 70 or 80 percent each year within the first two weeks of life. And that's just too high a rate of mortality for the population to replace itself. Warmer winters amplify a third major threat to the moose, infestations by winter ticks. These parasites spend the entire winter attached to the skin of the moose. Then, in the early spring, they drop off to lay their eggs. If they drop off between, say, February and April, if there is deep snow on the ground, it essentially kills them off. Enough ticks survive to jump on the moose and start the cycle again, but enough die so that the moose aren't overwhelmed. But in recent decades, that deep spring snow hasn't been there to kill off a portion of the ticks. So the winter ticks are hitting the ground, they're all surviving, their eggs are surviving. When winter comes around, all those surviving ticks attach themselves to the moose. And sometimes you'll see a moose with 100,000 ticks on it. They aren't eating well because the ticks are so uncomfortable that they're constantly just trying to scrape them off of their body. They end up starving to get to death or becoming anemic. They're called ghost moose because they're missing 60 to 70 percent of their hair, just bare skin. I mean, it's, it's horrifying looking. The moose population is declining directly as a consequence of climate change. There's just no reason to stop the subsistence hunt. People always talk about Indians living right on the edge of starvation or on the edge of survival. But not only did they provide themselves with this great diet, they had time to decorate even down to the little babies. The little babies outfits were beautifully decorated. I mean, who knows that these days? Every time I think about the Ojibwe people through time, uh, I just kind of shake my head and I thought, I thought why does, don't people know this? 400 years ago, the Ojibwe lands stretched for nearly 2,000 square miles, from Lake Ontario all the way to the northern Great Plains. It's where they hunted, fished, and harvested, where they danced, raised their children, and buried their loved ones. European settlers wanted that land, to farm, to log, to mine, to drill for oil and gas. In just a few hundred years, the descendants of those settlers helped to build an economy around extracting, refining, and burning that oil and gas, pushing up global temperatures, altering ecosystems, and changing the life cycles of species large and small. Today, the Ojibwe homelands are a fraction of what they once were, but their culture has endured. The resiliency of Native people is, uh, it can't be questioned, you know. We're still here. We've always just felt more connected to our environment, how we treat the earth. You know, I always wondered growing up if the, um, people would have taken the time to learn more about um, the Anishinaabe. You know, what would this country look like? I think it would be a lot stronger. 